All right, Deborah, I'm going to turn it over to you. Hey, thanks so much. Welcome, everybody, to our very first Long Armors quilt panel. Um, if you have any, we have a set of questions and we have some Long Armors to answer some of your questions. If you have a, something come up during the meeting, um, we'll have some time for question and answer after, but also in the chat bar, you can um, type in something. And if it's a question that we don't already have on the list, I'll add it as we go. So I'm going to take a couple of minutes and we'd like everyone to introduce themselves. Uh, give us some background on your work, including how long you've been long arming and why you started. So I'm just going to go real quick. I've been long arming since uh, I think 2015. Um, I've been a free motion quilter though since the, since the early 90s. And um, what got me started? Well, I don't think Alejandrina is on this call, but <laughs> she was with me at QuiltCon in 2015. And I, she walked by when I was testing a long arm and I said, pretty much the conversation went, should I get this? And she said, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so I asked my husband if we had enough money, on, you know, enough credit on the credit card and off we went. <laughs> So I don't take too many clients, just word of mouth. Um, so maybe four or five quilts that are paid per year. So Wendy, can you go next and tell us, uh, just take a couple minutes, give us some background on your work, how long you've been long arming and why you got started. Um, well, I've been long arming. I actually found the receipt for my long arm today. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> and uh, I actually got the long arm in 2006 and didn't really do anything until 2007. Um, I went with my husband and we, we both learned, you know, did the classes that came free with it together. And because I was working, you know, I owned the quilt shop at the time and I was making the, the samples and the class samples and he was long arming them. And I really suppose it was probably the end of 2007 when I really started because He's out of town for work and I need this sample for this class tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> so away I went. But I, you know, I, I started because I had had some quilts done and I really didn't care for them. You know, the, the stitch length was all over the place. You know, there were, there were the toe loopers and then there were little tight ones. And I thought, this is really, I've paid a lot of money for this. And so I was at market and I, saw it and I actually have the um Gamel Statler stitcher and Paul Statler was demonstrating it and thought oh this is wonderful came back and there was a Mancuso show in town so the two of us went to see you know what it was all about and <laughs> what the big number was and <laughs> that was the end of that <laughs> money gone <laughs> What about you, Mary? Really, Oops, I'm sorry. Go I ahead. Say, I really don't. Um, I probably do about 10, 12 a year for customers. Okay. Well, I am. I'm one of those odd people. When I started making quilts, I loved it. I loved buying fabric and sewing, but I always loved the quilting. To me, watching it turn into a quilt, you know, on my domestic machine was more fun which I know is the minority view, sort of. <laughs> but I worked really hard for about eight years to learn to be better and better at, at quilting on my domestic machine, on my Bernina. I could do feathers and all kinds of stuff. And um, I really enjoyed that, but I gave myself tendonitis twice and Ooh. in both elbows. And each time it took four months that I couldn't quilt at all or even lift anything. It hurt so much. Mm. So uh, that's why I got a long arm. A friend of mine had gotten one a year ahead of me and I hadn't really looked at them any place, but I was coming down to visit my daughter. I was in South Dakota, she was in Florida. So I stopped off in Clive, which is next to Des Moines, Iowa at the APQS place and tried them and i ordered one and really a lot of it was that but I, it's both that i love the quilting part and i really needed to have a long arm if i was going to do it because i just it was just physically hard to do it with the intensity i was doing it i guess 
And I only quilt word of mouth people in the guild pretty much. I have one friend in South Dakota who still sends me a, a quilt every two years or something. And I probably do maybe about 10 a year or two, not tons of them. And um, let's see, I can't remember what other questions were, but I think one of the most fun things about being a long armor, it's fun to quilt your own quilts, but it's really kind of fun to have something arrive. You've never seen it before. It's a challenge. It's, you know, figuring out how you're going to quilt it and then quilting it. It's just kind of a much broader range of quilts than I would get just doing my own. Thanks, Mary. Emily? What am I answering? You are answering to take a couple minutes to introduce yourself. Hello. Um, give us some background on your work, how long you've been long arming, and why or how you got started. Okay, so my name's Emily. I started at a quilt shop in Orlando, and I learned how to do computerized first on the long arm, and then I got introduced to free motion. So I, I like to do both. It depends on the quilt for me. Um, so I started there around 2015. I was on the long arm um, doing customer's quilts, and then... Um, I left there and I decided to get this bad boy. Um, and it's also, this machine is um, Miss Martha Cunningham, who was in our guild who passed away. So this is her quilt that I'm buying from the family. Um, and so I moved the machine in January this year and I have quite a few customer quilts lined up. <laughs> That's fabulous. So. Um, <clears throat> let's, let's ask our first question and whoever wants to jump in and answer it, you don't all have to answer it, but, um, I'm going to ask, how do you decide on what quilting design to put on a quilt? Is this done in collaboration with a quilter or is it usually the long armor's choice? Well, I think I might be the longest term one. I've been doing this for, um, 17 years. And I have had very few people tell me a lot about what they want. Uh, usually they leave it up to me. I would say 90% of the time people just say, I like what you do, so do whatever you want to. Once in a while, somebody will have a definite idea about something, like they'll want something circular in one area or something with straight lines here or there, or I, I can't think of any other examples. And I do try... Well, I mean, I will do what somebody asked me to do, but the limit is what I can do and do well. But, uh, and I did have somebody give me a quilt once and they wanted feathers and specific old fashioned designs. And I was doing more of that then, so I managed to do that. But um, I would say that if you have any ideas, I would give them to a long arm quilter, but I would also let them choose to some degree because we all know what we can do well and what we can't. And it's different for all of us, I think. Hey, I agree with you, Mary. And often, you know, I like you, I've had very few people that tell me, I want this. Most of them just, well, what do you suggest or do what you want? And uh, quite often you will get someone, well, I think I would like this. And I will say, well, can you tell me what you're going to do with it? Because some people, they bring it, they're sending it off to college with whoever. And they want something fancy that's going to cost them hundreds of dollars. And you say, you know, it's going to be around the dorm floor and thrown in the washing machine, don't you? <laughs> Not that you want to talk yourself out of earning any money, but you, you know, you have to think of that too. I think for, for me, um, one of the biggest pieces of input that I've received, and now I tend to ask this question, is the density of the quilting more than the design. Like, do you want an eighth, quarter inch apart or half, three quarter inch apart on your stitching? So that's more the input that I seek or receive. Um, yeah, for me, most of, most of my people will tell me just quilt whatever you want. Most of it is computerized. Um, if they do want free motion, they just tell me, hey, I want free motion. Every once in a while, they'll give me a picture for inspiration. And I can work off of that 
if it's computerized and they, they're usually requesting for something specific, like if it's Mickey Mouse quilt, they want Mickey Mouse on there or something like that. Very detailed. So since you're still talking to him, how about, can you tell um, what is the best way for a client to prepare their quilt? when they're getting it ready to send to you? What, what are some tips that you ask of them? Just to make sure your backing and batting is eight inches bigger, so four inches on each side, and then just press it nice and fold it nice. And I, I put mine up on a hanger so that they're not, they're not thrown around, they're being, they say, pretty um, flat. Okay. Anyone I else? would say too, I would say too, to check all of your seams, because there's nothing more annoying than getting three quarters of the way down the quilt and they haven't fully stitched the seam and you've missed it when you've gone over it to look. And then there's nothing you can do apart from mark that spot and let them hand stitch it closed when they get it back. You don't, do you offer to hand stitch it closed for them? I don't hand stitch. <laughs> 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 but I do, I've, I have done, I have ripped off borders because of measurement. You can't just slap a border down the edge of a quilt because it waves. And, and unlike when you do it on your domestic where you start on the center and you work out, so you can work those things out a little. When you get on the long arm, the more you go down, the more excess fabric magnifies. And so you get great big ripples. I mean. There are lots of tricks that you can use to ease the ripples. <laughs> but you know, the worst I had was 12 inches longer than the Ooh. inner part of the quilt. And there's nothing but rip it off at that point or put pleats in. And I guess I would give it this advice if somebody knew they was, were going to use a long arm quilter for their quilt. And, and different quilters might disagree on this. I would say the wisest thing is to press your seams open just so you don't end up with giant humps where a bunch of intersections come together. And we can quilt over that, but actually it works better even if they are not sure what they're gonna do, it'll work better on their domestic machine too, not to have, it depends on what the quilt is, of course. If it's just a corner, that's something. But if you have a lot of piecing where seams are coming together, I will quilt, I mean, I will just press it and put it on my machine and, and do it the way they brought it. But I'm less likely to break needles or have spots that I go around because I don't want to run my needle across 16 pieces of, you know, fabric stacked up. Um, so it's just, I've just turned to always pressing my seams open for myself. And there are quilts I've done where I think they would have come out better if the person had done that too. And I know that in the old days they all said press it to the dark side, but I don't think you need to do that as much when you're machine quilting any way you're machine quilting. It's going to hold the quilt together. Um, so speaking of prepping on a long arm quilt, how about anyone want to talk about the backing? Does anybody want to Give some advice about the backing that the quilter provides for you. <laughs> I would just say, I would try to, to be sure it's square. We have to have two parallel sides because we're gonna attach it on the one end and the other end and roll it up. And if it's four inches off, it's gonna sag. It's, it's gonna be like the wavy borders only across the whole quilt. So, and I can, I have often checked them and I will square them, but sometimes then you're getting into the area of, am I going to have that extra eight inches that Emily talked about? You know, so, and that's another thing is to be sure that they are plenty long or wide enough, the backing, just so that you can fiddle with it. If it's not straight, you can, you know, cut it until it is straight and still have enough. So I'm going to um, I'm going to get off the program for a little while, and I'm going to ask a couple of questions that just came in, and whoever wants to answer it. The first question is: um, Is there a best method for adding borders to keep everything square? Measure properly to measure through the center and then to other places. Don't um, 
measure down the outside because you have a tendency to have bias on the outside and you stretch it as you measure it. And if you can measure with a steel rule, it's much better than measuring with like, um, you know, the regular sewing type tape measure. That's what I find. Yes, I guess if you measure it and both sides in the middle are all slightly different, kind of average it, and then you will have yeah. to just work with it until they all are the same measurement. And that way, when you're done, it's square, too, if, if you've made it all come out. That's what I do. A lot of quilters don't like to use pins, but I would recommend using pins, pin them on. I always use pins and I pin the middle and I pin, you know, one, the quarter marks and then, then I quin, pin between them so it's even across if I'm trying to work out a, you know, where the actual outside edge is maybe an inch longer than the inside measurement. That's a, that's a really good tip. I'm going to ask, um, I do the same thing. I, I do a lot of pinning um, between each roll, but if you what are your let's ask your two best tips whether it is for someone quilting or just for a new long armor what would you say your best tips as an experienced long arm quilter are emily let's start with you uh come back to me okay <laughs> I'll start, I'll throw out, it's the same tip as they used to say about getting to Carnegie Hall for musician, and that's practice, practice, practice. The best thing anybody did for me, if my friend who started a year ahead of me gave me 37 quilt sandwiches to do for charity. What? I probably did about eight of them before people started giving me quilts, but I kept doing them. And the other thing is I keep a whole bunch of really old sandwiches that are about 10 feet long, vary from this to wider, that I can put, if I'm doing something on a quilt and I'm not sure I have the tension right, or I'm not sure that I have the right scale on something, and I can just fasten that on and practice. I mean, right when I have the quilt on it, I, I usually have a little space on the side or a lot of space, depending, and I will put on another piece and practice if I have to. I, I don't do that all the time, but it's just nice to be able to do that when you're right in the middle of something. Or if you're having trouble to it, it, it tells you if, you're, if you've gotten your stitches back under control again. Okay. <laughs> Any other tips? Any two best tips? I think pressing is a huge thing. My my quilting vastly improved once I was doing my own long arming, I can tell you. <laughs> you know, if you press nicely, it lays flat. And even you know, at the moment, there are lots of pre-cuts. And so a lot of the quilts come with a lot of bias edges where the pre-cut is cut up into triangles. And so I think, if you've taken care to press carefully, not to iron, so you don't stretch it, mm. you, you know, it really improves because you can only make good so much. You can't improve on something that is just unimprovable. I mean, for me, the nicest thing is to take a D cup and it comes out as a lovely flat quilt. <laughs> that is something that's really, it's like, I've done it. <laughs> what? That's a good. Um, so I have a tip that I just learned very recently. I used to load my quilt. I have a really long, uh, long arm, a good 12 feet. And I used to always load everything exactly center. And I found out that it ever so slightly pulls the canvas. So that if I looked at the edge of my canvas that you attach the quilt to, it kind of pulled it so it had a small warp in it. Someone told me, you don't have to load the quilt in the middle. You can load it to the right side or to the left side. And so that's what I've been doing lately. And it's smoothed out my canvases, my leads. So that's my one big tip probably for a new quilter. I wish someone had told me that from the beginning because I actually had to replace one of my canvases because of the stretching. I think they, they shrink and stretch over time. They do. I know mine, they have a tendency to like go inwards over time. So I just, I have zipper leaders. So I just unzip them and put a new pair of leaders on. Okay. I just move where I put the quilt. 
So not Good centered idea. anymore. Anybody else have a tip? Did we hear from everyone? For free motion quilting, if you want to practice the design without stitching, mine, mine broke by the way, but you can get a piece of acrylic like at Home Depot and um, cover the edges with some masking tape or duct tape and you can use an Expo marker. You can lay the whole board on your quilt and you can kind of try out a design with an Expo marker to see if you would like it, if it fits, things like that. That's a good idea and the tape is important so you see where the edges are and don't mark on the quilt but mm -hmm. also because then it's not as sharp on the fabric yeah that's a great tip don't keep scissors near your quilt <laughs> <laughs> when you're cutting threads make sure so here's a good tip uh, for cutting threads on the on the top layer of your quilt i either take my scissors and just um push the thread between but i don't close the scissors because I don't want to cut the quilt. So I either push the thread through the scissors like along the edge or use a seam ripper so that I don't poke a hole in the quilt as easily. It's another tip. I even have rounded tip scissors for what I use for trimming thread. Right, that's good. I have a question on the side. Um, I'm gonna go with, do you like to use one piece for your backing? or a pieced backing? Diane says uh, one. Diana says one. One is fat, I guess you're less likely to have sagging okay. or issues with it, but really with a long arm, once I get it on, once it's, once I've squared it and it's on, I re it doesn't really matter a lot. But it's a one piece backing is more likely to be flat. Square. That's the best case scenario, one piece, and then two, and that, but for a while, people were doing a lot of um, Bonnie Hunter quilts, and she was doing, telling people to sew together all your 10 inch squares and make a backing. It's horrendous, because you know, you get a, a seam on the top and a seam on the back, and yeah. then you get a big old thing to try and go through. Yeah, it's tough if it's, if it's just a few pieces of backing, four or five on a big quilt, not bad, but if it's 25 pieces of fabric on the back of that quilt, that's a challenge. It challenges you in several ways. The, the needle, squaring it, going through, kind lining like it up. the quilt you're doing now, Deborah? Uh, no, <laughs> not that one. Uh, but, but speaking of the quilt I'm doing now, <laughs> um, it reminded me of something. Um, when which direction should seam on backing go? Does anyone want to talk about the seam on the backing? Does it matter to you which direction the seam goes? It doesn't, Wendy? No, no. because sometimes it's the only way you can get it on is, is if it's horizontal. I mean, vertical is, is nice, but sometimes when it's vertical, if they haven't... Um, sewn a real nice consistent seam width whatever they may i mean half an inch is is a nice one for your back seam because it gives a good hold on it but um if if it's not square you know if you go half inch to quarter inch to eighth inch or whatever then sometimes you get like a funky sort of thing on the back you know you might get a little dip in one side and not the other and it's tight and so it's really just preferable, I think, to to um, do whatever works easiest with the backing you are given. I just want to say that us amateurs don't even see all that awful stuff. So whatever you do is awesome. So <laughs> sorry if we make those seams awful. <laughs> we're, I we're, don't. I well, I just want to say we're not here to judge anybody in no. their backing or their sewing. We're just talking about uh, best case scenarios. <laughs> we we don't the dream curse, we don't silently curse the maker as we're working on it. <laughs> Actually, I I sort of enjoy a challenge sometimes when there's something different that comes up. Um, I enjoy the challenge of it too. Like how 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 much better can I help this quilt along? 
it's lovely too when it comes in and you get it out and it looks nice true yeah it's a good challenge sometimes when you when you have a little wonky quilt um diana had a double question that i really like um if one of you could answer so her question if you look in the chat um is dealing with borders how do you like to quilt the borders is sort of one question and another question do you take the quilt off the frame and put it back on again and rotate it has anyone done that i did I, that recently oh yeah mm -hmm. um, i've heard of people doing that but i don't do it you don't I, do it Let, emily i was doing a computerized like custom so i was doing some different uh designs in the blocks and then there were two borders so I did the top and bottom border in the center, and then I did flip the quilt to do the sides. It depends on the design though. If it's easily, um, if I can easily match it up while I'm like rolling it forward, I could do it like separately as I'm going. But for that one, it was just easier to do it just to flip it and do that whole length at one time. Do you find it, the flipping of it challenging? I mean, it gets heavy to load to like reload a whole quilt that's already been quilted but it's not bad i think too once it's been quilted and you turn it it's fairly stable so it, it you know you can get a nice even second border on them mm -hmm. i was mainly just curious because i had to do that once because i had one that was so big i had a double border and I didn't know if I was, I didn't know, not that there's quilt police, but I didn't know the proper way I should have. I'm like, do I do the middle? Do I work in the center, work my way out? Do I work top to bottom and just come back? And so I was just, so I'm still, I've only had to do it once on a quilt before, but. I, I, I've flipped my quilt a bunch of times, um, mostly my quilts. I've even done it where, <laughs> this is probably bad uh, to do and I, but it's just the way I do it is once I flip it, I might not even flip it um, 90 degrees. I'll flip it a quarter so that the points will be at the top and the bottom. So it'll be on like a diamond instead. And then I, I really have to be unique about how I reattach the quilt to the rollers. And sometimes there's a lot of pinning to the roller for that. And that's usually for just a design effect. And I want to use some straight line quilting and. Uh, in a in an odd angle, so as I think as long as the quilt has a good base to it, like the overall quilt has some quilting in it, it's not um, it's not too bad to to take it off and put it back on again. I think you just do what is easiest to do for you. Right. One of the things that I think is fun about long arm quilting, which is also true just of king quilts, is to make double. Not yeah. big things, but just little things, but just things come up or you have to ask yourself the better way to do something. And usually there are several ways something could work. So you just do what you can do best or what seems the most logical. And then sometimes two days later, I'll think, oh, I could have done this instead, but you know, <laughs> oh well, it's done. You know, the, for me, the best thing is I belong to a few um, long arm groups and the support you get from other long armers is wonderful because you know you'll you'll just draw a blank on a quilt you you look at it and look at it and, I don't know what to do or how can I get around this and then someone will say oh you do this it's like really <laughs> well one of this is a very goofy little idea but for anybody new to this I started a long time ago taking a picture of the whole quilt when you often can't see the quilting and a close-up detail and the back. And I have all these pictures. Now that I've, I'm using my phone a lot, they're in two places. But I can actually run a slideshow of all of this quilting. And it's amazing what I have done and forgotten <laughs> that might be a good idea for some quilt that just has me stymied. So it's kind of useful to keep that kind of a picture slideshow option and I don't use it often but once in a while you get a quilt and you just don't get any ideas and sometimes I have to walk up to one and have the thread going and just start because I've thought about it for four days and I haven't decided but the pictures can help sometimes as do uh, books of quilting designs and things sometimes will give you a good idea 
Okay. Interest. What, um, I think we all know the answer to this, but what kind of machine do you have? And give me a pro and maybe a con about your specific machine. No one else is talking, so I'll jump in. I, <laughs> my machine is old, 17 years old. It's an APQS Millennium. It looks completely different than the new ones at the quilt shows. I mean, it just looks totally different now. But um, what's good about it is it is an old workhorse. They were built for people to have to work on themselves. I can call the company and the scariest thing was having to be my own mechanic, but they're very good at figuring out what's wrong based on how I put it in my very non-mechanical way. And uh, it, it's just amazing what they can help you do from a long distance. And I actually bought that because I lived closest to the factory and I actually did take it down there twice for them to tune it up or whatever. Uh, and now, of course, I've moved and I wouldn't dream of taking my, my head all the way to Carroll, Iowa. But um, it's turned out to be a good company. And I don't know how you would, you know, verify that ahead of time, but just you would want a company that will always help you when you're alone in your sewing room and you don't want this thing to just be a gigantic paperweight. Yeah. Sometimes you feel like it is. <laughs> if you can't figure it out. I'm gonna go next just because I have the same or similar machine as Mary. I have an APQS, but mine is a Lucy. Um, and I would say that my favorite things that I like about it is the tension is just fabulous. I rarely have a tension issue. And if I do, it's my fault. I've skipped a <laughs> ring or it's fallen out of a ring or I've changed the thread or the needle improperly. Um, the tension, and the reliability is good. I think for con, um, someday we're gonna move and it is a big machine. <laughs> it moves easily, all machines move easily. It's called mark everything as you take each screw out, believe me. <laughs> Pictures. This is upstairs. So it came apart, got it back together. On the how, how long is yours, Emily? Um, I think mine's either like the 10 or 12 foot. Okay. Yeah. And, what, and you have a Bernina. Tell us about your Bernina. Um, so I did learn on an APQS, so I did start there. Uh, the Bernina, it's the Q24 with the Qmatic. Um, I'd say the pros, I like the stitch quality is really good. Um, it's easy to use and it's personalized, so like I can adjust what the buttons do on the handles when I'm free motioning. Free motioning. Um, the only thing that is maybe a con, it's a little slower than other um, computerized machines, but you get a good stitch quality. Slower, what do you mean by slower? Like when you make it go on its own or when you, computer. the computer is slower, okay. Oh, when I tried one out at a quilt show, cause I have Bernina sewing machines and I love them. So I did try one. When I just would do free motion, just trying it uh, at the quilt show, I broke the thread every time and they kept having to fix it for me. So I think I quilt too fast for it, maybe. Okay. I'm not saying I'm always fast, but I tend to quilt fairly fast because it keeps the curves nice and whatnot. So I don't know because I've only tried that one for five minutes at a quilt show, but I, I know I can go a lot faster on mine. And yours. And Wendy? Well, I have a Gamel um, Optimum with a Statler stitcher. And um, I, to be honest, I very rarely take the belts off and do free motion on it because I can do so much without even needing to and get the effect of doing something free motion. And I kind of, I like the look of the way it always does the same length stitch if you want. I mean, for me, the con is that it's temperamental because I might change the bobbin and then it decides it doesn't want to go or it goes one day and the next day it's like, well, I don't think I like this type of needle today. Perhaps you should put a different one in me. <laughs> but when you talk to people, it's the same with all of them. My machine doesn't like some threads and other people, their machines love that thread. So I think it's like just a, a person. It's my, uh, my big Bertha. 
I think so. I think we've answered um, Sue's question. Do you free motion or computerize? I know Emily says she does some computerized. Did you say, Mary, you do some as well? No, I don't have any computer. The only computer part of my machine is just stitch regulator. Okay. So it's all free motion. Mine as well. I don't have any computerized. And let's see, is the cost of purchasing a long arm worth it? How did you justify it for yourself? For example, were you planning to recoup the cost by quilting for others? <laughs> well, that's such a fun question. Who wants to take that one on? Uh, for me, yes. I, I bought it to the start a business so that I got to pay for it. Well, I always have quilted for others, but until I retired, I also had a full-time job. So I've never been a full-time quilter. Um, with me, it was the tendonitis twice, and then both of my parents had died. I'm a lot older than the rest of you. And I had a little money from, from that, from an, you know a small inheritance. So I didn't have to borrow money. And I just invested it in my elbows, in effect, and got the long arm. Uh, the, my friend who got one a year ahead of me taught, but she had summers off. So she did, she did a lot of quilting for other people, especially in the summer. And she did hers specifically with the idea of paying it off, quilting for others. And she did. Um, but it is worth it if you like quilting. I mean, if you like the quilting part, I think it's well worth it. It really is rewarding, it's enjoyable, it's fun. Um, and I've always thought, even before I had the long arm, there's something about a, a quilt, you take a quilt top and you quilt it and bind it, and it just looks like it was meant to be somehow. It just, finishing a quilt just does something for it. However you're doing that, whether you're even, you know, hand quilting it. But, but when you're doing it on the long arm, you are finishing it, at least in terms of the quilting, and it's just satisfying, I guess. It is nice to um, just see the whole process start to finish from your piece of fabric in the quilt shop to your finished <laughs> top. But for me, my tops are finished when I've squared it up because I hate to bind. <laughs> I have a whole pile of quilts at the moment that need binding on. <laughs> so that's why it's nice too to do it for others because you square it up and you send it home and it's finished. <laughs> uh, so when I got mine, I did justify it and I did tell my husband that um, I intended to quilt enough to earn my keep on buying the machine. But I think it was a year and a half or two years after that, I went back to work full time. So now it's a side business. So it's my extra spending money. And hopefully someday when I retire, I'll do more pay for quilting. But I like to balance, I like to have a good balance between my quilts and client quilts, client slash uh, community giving quilts. I think that doing all three of those keeps my, kind of gives me balance because sometimes it's, uh, more daring to do my own work. I'm not as daring on other people's work, on other people's projects. So I like that. I like that balance of three. I, I sort of separate three different quilts, my own community, and um, someday I'll recoup what I paid for this machine with my clients. I think I've, at last, yeah, I've managed to do that, but I think it was because of having the quilt shop. So I. I recouped in what I would have been paying someone to quilt it for me. And then of course, you know, I took a lot in too. So in the end, it, it kind of evened itself out. So speaking of recouping and the cost, um, how do you determine how much to charge a client? Well, Just whatever. Sorry, Mary. My square inch. I know there are different ways of, of charging. I've heard of people who charge by the bobbin. I don't know how you would do that because I keep all these colors and half the bobbins I use are not full bobbins. Besides that would mean I'd have to mindfully keep track while I'm quilting and I just tend not to do that. But um, I charge by the square inch 
And if somebody tells me what they want, and I decide I want to do something a little bit more elaborate or intense, I would only, I would charge them what they asked for, not what I did, because I did that because I just thought it would be a bad will to us, if you want to call it that. I know there's a real range of, of prices too, and I, you know, I think in different areas it it's becomes generally that in that area. Um, so I guess I would ask if I were going to have somebody quilt my quilts, I'd ask because I would have no idea. Even a long arm quilter for 16, 17 years, I wouldn't really know what to expect somebody to tell me it would what it would cost. But I do it by the square inch. You can figure that out yourself before you bring a quilt, you know, to me. I do by the square inch too. And, and obviously it depends on whether it's just an all over design or whether it's a custom design because, you know, I'm not very good at pricing custom. I always spend so much more time than I've earned. <laughs> you know, I'm thinking, oh, I'm doing this for a couple of bucks an hour here. <laughs> But, you know, and I think it depends too on the people. I know I've heard of people by where their client is so rude to them and not very pleasant that the next time they bring something, they price it out of the range for them so they don't have to deal with people's unpleasantness. <laughs> I had uh, a lady that I'm in the long arm group with in um, St. Augustine. She ha she is the most, uh, when I grow up, I want to be her. <laughs> She's the most beautiful quilter. And uh, she did a quilt for someone. And then she got a thank you letter a couple months later saying, I didn't like what you did on my quilt, but it got a first place ribbon. So it's okay now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's not very kind. Oh. Hey, Emily, what do you charge? Uh, so I do by the square inch as well. Um, I do like computerized is two cents and then um, anything, I'll, I'll do like basic meander or loop, something very simple for two cents if I need to do um, by hand. Um, but free motion, like if I have to go around something on t-shirt quilts, um, that starts at three cents. And then if I'm doing like real custom, it, it'll start at four cents and can go up to probably about like seven or eight cents depending on what I'm doing. I'm in Emily's boat, but I've never charged anybody seven cents yet. So I don't I have any. <laughs> so yeah, between two and five cents a square inch, depending on the density and the complexity is where I am too. Um, so that's all the questions that I have for all of us. Uh, I'm gonna open it up if anybody else has a question. I, did I see you raise your hand, Diane? Or go ahead. What do you got? Actually, I do. I had one that I want to pose to anybody who has a long arm. Um, my husband does not like the feel of the back sides of the quilts. He doesn't feel they're soft enough. So I'm making a quilt. Since we moved from Ohio, I have all of these queen size flannel sheets sets that we don't use anymore. And I was thinking of trying to use a flannel sheet backing. Have any of you guys ever tried that? I've done it for people and sheets. I, I don't have an issue with it. I know lots of people do, but I feel it's your quilt and you know did you what use, you um, want did is, you use batting with it because i was like yes, it's gonna make yes. it okay and you didn't yeah, have I, just, with the I mean just the you could use just the thin batting mm -hmm. i mean i even i i try doing a quilt with a minky back with yeah. no batting <laughs> that was the biggest <laughs> mistake you know it takes you 10 minutes to put in and 10 hours to take out the stitches so. <laughs> Yeah. So, um, yeah, I didn't want minky, but I thought, you know, we've got all these flannel sheets yeah, that we are they, never going to use here in Florida. And I was like, I may as well use them. I would wash them first, though. I mean, if, if they're brand new, but if you've no, used they're them, not then they will be... They're ones that we've used for a while. Yeah. So. They'll, yeah. I don't, I've never had any issue with using sheets of any description on the back. Mm -hmm. I would say the main thing would be as long as they're not something st stretchy, if they're all cotton or mostly cotton, so they're not going to stretch when they're, you know, spread out the full width of your machine. 
that would be the only question I'd have, but I would guess it would work. I've done a quilt with Minky too, and I kind of wondered about it, but it came out okay. But it, that was for a nurse, someone in a nursing home. It was a gift, and uh, I want something really soft. So it wasn't great quilt. It was like in size, maybe. Yeah. Maybe not even that big. I I've not used a, um, a sheet, but I have used flannel fabric. Um, I did a whole bunch of um, Christmas throws for my kids a couple of years ago, and I was careful about trying to make sure the flannel was dense enough and I did pre-wash and pre-shrink it and I actually sent them all out because by the time I got five of them down I didn't have time to quilt five of them and there was no complaints it quilted just fine um, even the ones that were pieced I didn't have any problem. Good. Deborah, I just heard somebody say that they used sheets before I've never I mean like I've wondered why we never did that because we don't have to worry about the size of the quilt and the size of the fabric. So are sheets something that people use? I have, I've used lady sheets, like kid me like for crib size. I've used twin size. I think um, why, why people don't tend to want to do it is because the thread count is higher. But I mean, I if someone sends me a sheet, a sheet it is. <laughs> and I, I haven't had any issues. So well, some of the sheets these days are pretty cheap. I don't think you have to worry the and the thread count it may be higher, but those threads are so thin that I don't think your needle is going to have a problem. Any other questions? Comments? Well, I just wanted to say I got a couple of really great tips. Personally, I've always been a little intimidated to send my quilts to a long armor because I am afraid that I'm going to do everything wrong because I frequently do. But <laughs> there's <laughs> nothing wrong ever. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I really the um, I love the tip for that you mentioned about the acrylic for just when I'm quilting on my own machine about putting the acry the acrylic sheet and then drawing the design out. Mm -hmm. I think that. But that's a brilliant idea because I'm always very excited that. It's really neat if you have several ideas and you can try them all, you know, even over and over again. I'll draw uh, and take a you picture and erase it and draw again, take a picture and see which one I like better. Okay. Yeah. One of the things that I like to do because I, I had a piece of acrylic and it broke and I just have not replaced it is I've taken my iPad. And I've taken, like if I'm just trying to work with one block at a time, I've taken a picture of it and, in, and then you pull it up in your iPad and you can even use your finger or one of the little styluses with a color and you can draw right on it. So I've done that as well as a backup. I've it taken on and printed them and printed a bunch of copies and drawn on it too. Mm -hmm. Deborah, you gave us um, an app one yeah. time didn't you because I know I've got that you can take a picture of the quilt and then you know just select a block or whatever you want I can't yeah. remember what it was called though what was it called uh actually you can just do it in your photos all oh, right you can just do it right from your photos on your phone you can there's a couple apps out there that you can use too but um if you're just doing it real quick and and you know uh quick and dirty you just take a picture use your open it again um, and then edit it where you can mark on it and you can zoom in go really close to get thin lines on one block and then go back out to see the whole thing so just just your photo app is, is fabulous for that and I use it sometimes to um, send samples hey client a do you like this design or that design that look like all the questions? I think it is. You did. Well, for new, new long armors, another thing, I, I often have a bunch of sheets of paper and, and draw a whole bunch of designs. It's just, you know, something I do. And my drawing is terrible. If people saw the way I draw them, they would never let me try to quilt them on a quilt. But the quilting, <laughs> something about the machine makes it work better. 
but uh, that is just something you can always draw it. And I'm not drawing it the way sometimes people say, draw it a million times for muscle memory. I'm just drawing it to see, you know, the way I, whether I like the way it looks or two designs next to each other or whatever. You can't go wrong with just sketching it out. Mm -hmm. I have a question about thread. I love variegated thread. I quit my home with all the time. Mm -hmm. And I do have to rent a long arm. I don't own one. And they always refuse to use variegated thread. What? On the, uh, in, if you rent a long arm. Because Why? they say it breaks too much. Well, I'm sorry. I'm a little like Edie. I break the thread anyway. I wouldn't know if it was better or worse with the variegated thread. Um, and I had to have some quilts long armed a while ago because I broke my arm. But uh, anyway, and she said, well, I'll put it on the bottom, but not on the top. Well, and I'm like, okay. You need I never heard that before. Mm -hmm. Julie, you need a new long armor. <laughs> okay. Well, that's, that would be okay. <laughs> uh, is any, do any of you here on the panel have issues with variegated thread? I, I haven't. Well, I did actually, I did get a good tip, which I had never thought of. When you wind the bobbin with the variegated, so say you go blue, yellow, green, you know, it'll wind down. When you take it back off of the bobbin, it's going green, yellow, blue. So what oh. you would do to get the same coming off of the top and the bottom is you wind your bobbin and then you wind a bobbin from the bobbin so you get the same colors coming through okay huh. interesting yeah so you don't get like the um especially like if you have a thread break and then you've got to go over it it's like oh well now i've got this different color pop coming up <laughs> well does the thread have nap like embroidery thread so that it should only go one way but it should come off the spool the right way so no because um if you think about it your bobbin is always wound the opposite way to your top thread because what you comes off the bobbin off of the top thread first goes on the bobbin first so what comes off of the bobbin first is the last piece you put on so it's coming off backwards okay Thank you. I, uh, <laughs> yeah, I just pulled out my variegated thread just to look at it. And I don't know. I don't see anything different. So I, it, what kind of thread? Pardon? What kind of thread? What brand? What, this one is Isocord, which I don't typically okay. use, but it was given to me for a project. Mm -hmm. So that's a good question, too. Um, so this is Isocord thread, which is not what I typically purchased, but I used it because a client gave it to me. Does I always anyone have a thread preference? I was going to say, I like, when I work on my domestic, I always like the isocord when I would do the free motion quilting, but I like glide. I like <laughs> glide. Color. I think own. that if you were a new long armor, you might want to try a whole bunch of things and pick one you like. And I picked one years ago because this is so long ago that they used to have list serves instead of you know, websites or, or Facebook or any of that. So people would send in questions and answers and you just get these long pages of things. And a lot of people recommended Isocord. This was, like I said, ages ago, 16, 17 years ago. And it's strong because it's an embroidery thread and it's thin and it comes in a zillion colors. So I started getting Isocord then and now I have like, I don't know, 130 colors of it. So if I get a quilt that I don't have a color, I buy more. I always use the same thread. It's just easy. I don't have to adjust it. And I, I at one point early on, I thought I'd want to use lots of kinds of threads. I bought a lot of different kinds of thread. But, you know, if you don't want tension to be an issue and you want to know what to expect always, that's just one idea is to pick a thread and stick with it if it works well with your machine. So that when you accumulate a hundred colors, you know, it's it's a hundred colors of the same thread, not 30 different kinds of thread. All right, we're gonna finish up with that question. That's our last question is um, your thread preferences. Anyone else? I, I just discovered Micro Quilter. 
I, I was watching, um, you know, some of, there's been a Gamal, two twice a day there have been Gamal education videos since we've been locked down. And uh, one of the teachers was using it. So I thought, oh, I have some I bought and I've never tried. I, it's like lovely. It gives you texture without adding color. So, you know, you choose a, a, a like a comparable color and then it gives you lovely texture on it. Emily, did you want to say something about your thread? Oh, I, I use Isocord and Metler. Those two are my favorite. I do have some Glide, um, but I like to use a 60 weight in my bobbin. I get more on the bobbin, so it lasts longer. And I just like the how thin it is on the backing. And um, Glide doesn't like when I use uh, the 60 weight in the bobbin. They just don't want to work together. So if I'm using Glide, I have to use Glide in the bobbin as well. But so I usually like to use Isocord and Bettler so I can use a uh, lighter weight on the back. Well, I want to say a big thank you to Edie for putting this together and hosting the Zoom event, and also to Emily, Wendy, and Mary for agreeing to participate and answer the questions. Uh, thank you for everybody that participated, and we'll see you, is it next week already? Next yes. week at the meeting. Oh, wow. <laughs> so we'll see you then. Thank you, yeah. ladies. I really Good appreciate night. it. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Edie. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank, thank you, Deborah. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.